chat. <laughs> there you go. Waiting room chat. I like that. So welcome to Museum Nights. Uh, Museum Nights is our monthly after hours program here at the Harn and we have gone virtual. So um, we've done about two or three virtual Museum Nights so far. So we're really excited to have Linda and Sarah joining us tonight. Um, and we are going to be looking at some video from our exhibition, Tempest Fugit. And then Sarah and Linda are gonna be sharing with us about Studio TM located in Gainesville and showing us um, a video of a creation of a lidded incense box. So um, welcome Sarah and Linda. Would you guys just like to quickly introduce yourselves before we get started? Yeah, sure. Alinda, go ahead. Hi, I'm Alinda. I used to go to UF. I graduated about three years ago. And this past year, I moved back to Gainesville to uh, continue my studio practice with, at Studio TM. <laughs> awesome. And my name's Sarah Truman. Uh, I have my MFA uh, from Ole Miss, and I teach at Gainesville High School. I'm a ceramics instructor, uh, and I own Studio TM. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to play a little video that we have of our curator, Elisa Payton, inside the exhibition um, Tempest Fugit. So I'm going to play that for you all now. Welcome to Museum Nights. I'm Elisa Payton, Assistant Curator of Asian Art and Curator of this exhibition, Tempest Fugit or Time Flies. Uh, we're standing in the North Gallery of the Asian Art Wing at the Harm Museum of Art, and this exhibition is called Tempest Fugit, Kuan and Kodoshi, Time Flies. Um, and the idea is that we can look at time in many different ways. We can think about the nature of time, or how we measure time, or how we experience time. The experience of time can be more culturally specific, um, maybe, maybe even globally specific right now when we think about the pandemic and how it might be influencing your experience of the way time passes. So in this exhibition, um, the focus is on uh, linear time, cyclical time, simultaneous time. Um, linear time, thinking about a lifespan from beginning to end and not just of human beings, but also uh, all the creatures that share the planet with us or the planet itself. I mean, thinking about the aging of rocks or um, the lifespan of a fruit fly. So we can think of time in a cyclical way as well. So thinking about the seasons and how things change over the period of the year um, and the kind of inherent ephemerality of that, how the blossoming of um, cherry trees in the spring only lasts for a moment. Or, um, for example, some artwork in this exhibition really portrays a particular moment in time. Um, artists' experience of time is very different too. You may have experienced being in the zone when you're working on something. Um, and artists working in cloisonne, in print, in painting, even though they're capturing a specific moment in time, it might take um, a very intense period of process to get to that moment in time. So there's kind of a, um, a discontinuity there. So in this exhibition, there's a great example of linear time. This is a hand scroll, and it is pretty extraordinary that it's almost 53 feet long. So we couldn't show all of it at once, um, but from right to left, from beginning to end, it shows a journey from the mountain to the sea. And it could also be seen as a metaphor for a person's life from beginning to end. During this exhibition, which will be up for two years, every six months, the scroll will be shifted so you'll see a different scene. In a slower way, this reflects the interactivity that this hand scroll was meant to um, embody. 
So when people would look at a hand scroll together, uh, what would happen is it would be unrolled in scenes a portion of the time. Um, and so each scene, um, you know, there might be commentary on it, uh, time to really reflect and enjoy. And so this uh, replicates that just on a much slower time scale. So today we're going to look at Kogo, which are miniature ceramic incense containers. Um, and there's three in the exhibition, and we'll look at a few more from the collection. So Kogo, um, uh, for example, would be used to hold pieces of incense wood or aromatics that were used in a couple different kind of ceremonies. So the Japanese um, arts of flower arranging, uh, tea ceremony, and incense ceremony of those three, incense ceremony is the one that's the least familiar to most of us. So in incense ceremony, about 10 people would get together and a variety of scents, sometimes up to, to eight or 10, uh, would be passed along, around and then burned. As the incense is being burned, the participants would um, think about uh, different aspects of poetry or literature or the seasons, depending on how the game was set up how the Master of Ceremonies had uh, determined the game would be laid out. Incense as a unit of time measurement has been used for a very long time in East Asia. And so depending on the material that the incense was made out of, whether it was a paste or raw material or wood, um, incense sticks could be marked in different intervals to let you know when the time had passed, or you could have sort of an alarm system. For example, you might have uh, a boat with an incense stick across it with threads and when you got to a certain thread you could have a bell that dropped and sort of like an alarm system. Another way that incense is used in uh, time measurement in other contexts would be um, for example in a Buddhist temple where you might have a very very long string coil of incense that um, marks the d hours of the night. So. So kogo can be manufactured in a variety of different materials. They can be made of lacquer, ceramic, wood, ivory, metal. Um, and the ones that we have uh, to show you close up here are made out of ceramic. And one thing that's interesting about uh, the process of firing in ceramics is that you have to take the first firing very slowly. You have to make sure that all of the water molecules in the clay are evaporated so they don't explode in the kiln. One thing that's interesting to me is thinking about how we try to use ritual um, and process in order to make time make meaning. And one of the things that Kogo come with um, or they're packaged in are these beautifully made boxes. So in these boxes you might have something um, intricate like a leather pouch, you might have an inscription on the lid, and this one just says um, monkey kogo. And then um, a brightly colored wrapping cloth. So this is something that would protect the kogo uh, during transit. And also these boxes can be seen as artwork in themselves. Um, so this kogo here is from the Edo period, specifically the 18th century. And it shows a monkey dressed in a summer kimono holding a fan. It's made of bizen clay and it's unglazed. You can see on the inside here um, that it would be, it has a shallow opening to hold uh, materials. Here's another Kogo from the Edo period, also 18th century. And this one's a little bit deeper. And this has a Shino glaze, which is this white thick glaze that cracks a little bit so you can see the under uh, body of the clay. And it has uh, a little duck, and it has uh, the wheel uh, signifying um, the, the Dharma or Buddhist teachings. And this is a relatively simple box that it came with. And I wanted to give you an example of an abstract design. This is a kogo from the 20th century, not depicting anything in particular. It doesn't have any animal motifs, um, but it's abstract, and it really calls attention to uh, the Celadon glaze. This was made by an artist called Suzuki Sensai, and he was born in 1936. Celadon is prized uh, as a glaze. 
throughout Asia um, from time immemorial because of its similarity to the color of jade. And finally, I want to show you a kogo by 19th century Buddhist nun Otagaki Rengetsu, this tanuki kogo. And a tanuki is a subspecies of East Asian um, raccoon dog. So it's a real animal, but in Japanese folklore, uh, it has supernatural abilities. So if you've ever played Super Mario Brothers 3D or any of the Super Mario Brothers, you'll know that you can put on a tanuki suit and that you can shape shift. And that's exactly historically what the tanuki could do. Um, it could shapeshift, it could uh, possess people, um, and it could be awfully mischievous. So this kogo, which would hold um, the incense or aromatics, um, is interesting because um, Lotus Moon would also inscribe poems on there. So one of the precursors to haiku was a poetry form called waka. So on all of her ceramics, she would inscribe original poetry. What's interesting to me about that is that usually when, you in, um, when you're writing poetry, um, pen and ink on paper, that's a material that might not last long. Um, but if you do it on ceramics, it's something that will last forever. So she's made her words uh, kind of immortal. So a couple things. First of all, huge thank you to Elisa Payton for that awesome little snippet into the exhibit. For anyone watching that wants to ask questions about the exhibit for Elisa, she's actually with us tonight. Um, she'll be hanging around in the background. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and she will definitely be able to answer those tonight. Um, and if you're interested in making some Looks like we lost, uh, here she is. <laughs> I'm like, where'd she go? Oh, that's so good. <clears throat> um, as I was saying, we, um, on our Harnet homepage, we have some related art activities that feature more of Elisa's awesome videos, as well as another educator, Paige Willis. So definitely check that out. Um, so we'll keep moving on and we will turn to Studio TM. And we have Sarah and Elinda here with us. Um, they are ceramic artists and educators who are gonna share with us a little bit about their practice, a little bit about Studio TM. And actually, if you'd like to introduce this video that we have in the other uh, corner here, um, we'll learn a little bit more about what that is. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Go ahead. Okay, well, you know, to address the pictures that you have been seeing since uh, we started, um, the Harn reached out to our studio because they saw this photo over here of the white incense burner that I made. And I have that particular one right here. Um, because their, you know, topics are the Kogo boxes that hold incense and they thought it would be a great um, bridge to kind of get us together and collaborating. And to take it a step further, I wanted to make a video uh, constructing a box similar to the one on the screen to the left so that those who don't know about the processes of clay can kind of see and visualize how you get from like a ball of dirt to a box that can actually hold things. Awesome. So there is we're looking at the still images. Yes. And you have a video as well that shows the process. Yeah, that I will play after the video of a quick tour that we have of the studio. Okay. Um, another studio member we have is Bianca Williams and she couldn't make it tonight. But if you see a, like a little reflection in the mirror, that's her. So I'll play this so you guys can kind of get a little walkthrough of how our studio looks. And then she did, did all the gardening on the outside, so she's a great landscaper. <laughs> so 
So what you're seeing is the main room and then we have a wall for uh, art. This is the hallway that leads into the kiln room where we fire the pieces. You know, a lovely model. And then we see fit fired work in the kiln. Awesome. Yeah, that's an awesome space. So you have, um, do you have wheels as well for throwing? In there? Yeah, the video yeah. didn't pan over to the room on the right, which has our private studios. But each of us, we have a wheel, a table, shelving, like the three of us share the space in that room. Very cool. So um, could you give us a little bit of background on how Studio Team started? Yeah, sure. So um, my wife and I moved back here for her to finish her doctorate at UF. And um, I was working in and out of lots of other studios and a friend connected us to the space that we have now. And so we moved in there in 2016. And at first it was just me and my tools. I started acquiring more equipment and realized I could take a studio assistant, kind of give them a year bridge in between UF Ceramics finishing up their undergrad or grad program and what they're gonna do next. So Bianca was the first person we took. Um, I Linda came back after residency and kind of did that for a little bit of an in-between. Um, and then right now it's the three of us sharing the space. So it's kind of more from my private space to a community space to our shared studios right now. Awesome. Uh, how, how is the dynamic working in the same space with other artists? Um, I think it's pretty good. Like we've all been working together for a while. Um, you know, I, Linda and Bianca were classmates. So that helps. Uh, Bianca has been putting up with me for a few years now. So she has a lot of practice. Um, and then with COVID actually, I moved my wheel home for a couple months and I let them use the studio and I've just been taking my stuff to fire. So I'm slowly starting to come out of my garage and go back into the space. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So would you like to show the video? Yes, so this video has its own screen. So it'll be playing in the background. I have written like on text screen what step we're in. So if anyone has a question, you can just type it in the comments with the number so that we have a reference and you know we'll answer the questions when we get to that section. Yeah, so I'll just we, play this. It has no audio. It'll just be in the background while we have a discussion. Perfect. Yeah, so um, anyone watching that wants to ask any questions, again, leave those in the chat and we'll, we'll get to those. Um, but I have some questions of my own, so I will <laughs> ask you guys some of those. Um, Islinda, can you tell us a little bit about how what drew you to creating the incense holders and kind of how you started that? Project? Yeah, a lot of my work I um, is based on things to be used, especially things that have a particular use. And a lot of the inspiration that comes to deciding what I make is reflective of what I'm interested in my personal life. And, you know, I got back to burning incense in the room for smells and like just refreshing the mind. And I wanted to kind of troubleshoot and test the kind of puzzle aspect of designing something that has a specific use. Um, I have my personal <laughs> incense burner here. Right now it's filled with sand, but I really, you know, enjoy incense as a way to kind of, it's like a mint for the mind, you know, everything just gets refreshed. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Would you say that it's like a, a more introductory shape that most people could kind of grasp in terms of something that they're hand building? Yeah, um, it's all simple, you know, I broke this down into a template where you can just cut everything out and piece it together, kind of like how you would build with paper, but instead of paper, it's just slabs of clay. Right, right. awesome. So I'm just looking over my questions. So uh, Sarah, your uh, 
our educator in the high school setting, yes. correct? How, um, what is your favorite aspect of teaching art, you know, versus in your studio, in the public school system, Linda, you know, what's your personal favorite part of being an educator, being able to, to teach people these methods? I think in the K-12 setting, <clears throat> primarily the clay is like the great equalizer, right? Because every one of the kids comes from such a different background, especially at my school. It's um, very, very mixed with like all the different magnets and then kids that are zoned for us. Um, and so my class is the class that's not required that everyone can just decide to take. So it's mixed in grades. Um, and so to have that level playing field for them, I feel like is a really excellent confidence booster. Um, and it gives them that reality um, of initial failure and then building on that failure, right? Because clay, like you're not good at it the first time you touch it. And I think that's the thing that's so addictive to it um, is that you always get better, right? You're building muscle memory. And so for me, that energy translates into my studio, right? Like I can go right after work and still work five hours later. Like, I feel like that kind of just reinvigorates what I'm doing, like reminding myself that I get better every time. And then you get into that flow and like, they start to understand it. So midway through the year, they're like, can I just stay in here? Can I not go to lunch? How long are you gonna be here after school? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's very um, energizing in my own practice. Yeah, and that definitely was me when I was a high schooler taking ceramic classes. I would, you know, sneak in for lunch or stay after uh, school had been released and, you know, try to finish projects when I get the time. Yeah, I think for yeah. me as um, someone who teaches uh, ceramics, I find it that whatever age range, like I can relate to the student because like Sarah said, we've all been there starting with clay and we all know the um, struggles and how to deal with them. So we can really empathize with like someone who's older, who's just picking up clay or someone who's like five and they're just, you know, trying to make a teddy bear. Right. <laughs> and with me, when I teach, for some reason, I like sneak in like life lessons or like, yeah, the clay, you know, you have to work with it. Like you have to work with other people. You gotta, you know, <laughs> collaborate. Yeah. It breaks in the kiln and yeah. You know, you keep going. Yeah, yeah. You got, yeah, you gotta keep going. You have to cope. And, you know, I think uh, one of the points that I really uh, harp on with students is that, you know, you your next pot will be better. Like every pot you make will obviously be better than the last because you learn so much from mm -hmm. failing. Yeah, yeah. I think clay is one of those really like therapeutic mediums just between manipulating it physically, um, but also a lot of the points that you're bringing up and you know, just relates to life. <laughs> Yeah, the tactile nature gets so much out of their hands, right? And the rest of your classes, you're supposed to sit and you're just doing, you know, your work. And it's very much like click, click, click for each moment of time when you're in the room, where as when you come into your ceramics class, you know, you've got a few minutes of um, instruction here and then no instruction for a few days. And it's just working and using your hands. So they're getting out that energy. They're able to get up and move around the room you know, using that tactile ability, it's, um, it's a completely different way of learning. Yeah, definitely. Would you say that for either of you, any of these things were what drew you to ceramics originally? I would say the tactile thing is definitely what drew me. As a former high school athlete, like the ability to build on it more and more. It was also the first thing I was ever really bad at. Um, I was terribly allergic to the clay. I've built up a tolerance to the red iron now. Uh, but I was terribly allergic to earthenware when I started in undergrad. I would break out in hives when I was in the ceramic studio and I was terrible at it. I was that kid that everything I built broke. I couldn't see things in 3D. Um, it was really, really challenging. So uh, for me, it was that I could definitely build on that and get better every time. Yeah, for me, I um, found my clay program at my high school and I was really drawn to the idea of making something 3D. Like um, the drawing classes or painting classes really didn't like, you know, draw to me, but like the idea of 
troubleshooting something and building it in real space. I think that's what I was really attracted attracted to about ceramics. Right. Awesome. We have a couple of questions that have come in. So I just want to sure cool. we get a couple of those. Um, so first is a, a three part question. Do you have a preference for throwing on the wheel or hand building? Do you have a preferred clay body and have the circumstances of COVID changed any of this or your approach? Sure. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm a thrower. Like I use my wheel almost exclusively. Uh, I use earthenware that hasn't changed. Uh, my approach has shifted a little bit since COVID started. Going back into my studio and having uninterrupted studio time has been uh, really amazing. And so I started approaching my pots differently. They're larger. They're a lot larger than they have been in the past several years. Um, and before I was like doing like a watercolor wash on everything and I've taken that off. And now it's, um, it's all slip work. So it's, it's quite a bit different. Um, for me, I, it's been a long time, but uh, I used to be like strictly on the wheel and it was hard for me to think outside of the wheel. And then now I use a wheel as a tool in hand building. I find that I just personally feel the creative flow you know, easier when I actually can move things and man manipulate things right in front of me. For some reason, like the wheel is just very static to me. So I'll just make forms on the wheel, take them off and cut them to construct them together. Um, I have found my way back to P5 clay, which is like a porcelainous uh, white clay that it's gray and I haven't used it since I graduated undergrad from UF and I came back to it and just the feel of the plasticity of the clay I'm like I really miss it I'm like I forgot how this clay feels and it feels nice <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, my, I got booted off for a second but I'm back oh okay um, yeah and then my how my work has changed um when COVID, you know, first hit Gainesville, I guess that, you know, reflected in my studio practice, we're like, oh, everything's shut down. We're not, you know, doing anything. So I kind of, you know, went into that mode. But when I got out of it, I was interested in like making work that would have a quick turnaround time just for myself, because if I like get stuck mid process with projects, sometimes they get lost and like don't get finished. So the goal was like, let's, you know, have a faster turnaround. And what I've been working on in my studio is uh, slip transfers. So drawing my design on uh, paper with the colored ceramic material and then transferring it over to my pod. So there's, the, there's less lag time between each step. And can you just briefly define what slip is? Slip is clay that is watered down. So you see in the video how I am scraping the box after I wet it with a sponge and cleaning off that card. The material on there is like that wet, slippy <laughs> material that we use. So I'm gonna ask another question from the chat from Paige. Uh, are you inspired to collaborate as studio mates? I feel like we don't do a lot of collaboration, I think. Yeah, I think we're all at the studio more than our work. Yeah, we're always, you know, rearranging the studio to meet like our needs as individuals and as a group where, you know, we at one point were, were teaching classes out of the uh, studio before COVID and we had to rearrange and make sure everyone still had storage space and um, places to put their wet work and dry work and glaze work. So it's a lot of change physically that happens in the studio because of our making styles. Looks like Mimi's momentarily frozen. 
while she's coming back, I'm going to just share a couple of chat comments. This is Eric from the Harn. Um, so uh, let's see. Carolyn says, yay. Oh, there's Mimi. You're back. Cool. <laughs> I'll just let Carolyn finish what you're saying, which is yay, Sarah. Woo woo for muscle memory. <laughs> oh, yes. Thanks. I keep getting booted. Um, so did you hear my, my question that Paige posed about? Um, yeah, we were talking about collaborating in the, we collaborate more in the space than we do on actual ceramic work. Yeah, on our but, personal work. I think the collaboration for each other's work is more mental. Like we will kind of like absorb things from what's happening around us by like Bianca's her studios next to mine. And I see that like she's working with color and then it just makes me excited to use color in my work. And I think it's just kind of like leeches into your mind. <laughs> right, yeah. That totally rubs off on you when you're surrounded by other people that are creating. Um, we have another question from Nigel. Um, can you talk a bit more about what can be frustrating about the medium? And also, can you please explain some of the terms you're using? What does plastic mean? I think you mentioned the plasticity of the, of the clay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for plasticity, it's like if you are playing with Play-Doh and you get like a fresh tub of Play-Doh and you roll it into a snake and like you bend it into a rainbow and it just flows into that rainbow. There's no cracks. It just looks like a noodle arm. And then, you know, that is like great plasticity. You know, the material can flex very well. And then when you have the same tub of Play-Doh and it like dries out for a couple of days, when you try to roll that snake and make that bend again, you start seeing cracks. And sometimes it just breaks because it's lost that plasticity. That makes sense. That's a perfect explanation. Good yeah. job. <laughs> um, and then the, the second part, the second question was, can you talk a bit more about what can be frustrating about the medium? Um, I feel like it's like the more you know, the more clay can punish you. <laughs> right? What do you mean by that? <laughs> like, um, you know, you think you're smarter, right? And you've acquired all this knowledge and you're rushing to finish work and then you put it in the kiln and you preheat it, right? Because you know the temperature water boils at and you know the kiln is going to rise just slow enough to take that heat out and you go too fast and even now, like, you blow it all up and you're like, that's... Like, you know that water boils at 212, dummy. Like, you know, you knew not to do it, but you're like, but I'm smarter and I'm so educated in my material and I know my things and I know my kiln. And, you know, I would spend hours decorating something and then turn around to put it on the shelf and smack the shelf and break something. Like you dip it in a bottle, a bucket of glaze, you bring your hand out and you shake the glaze off, you drop it in the floor. Like <laughs> there are things, you know, that you do. Um, I, I tell the kids, it's like baseball. It's only going to break your heart. Right? <laughs> no. So the more you, the more you do it, right. The more chances you have of it being successful. And you learn from all of these things, like, you know, every now and then you have to blow your kiln up and go, yeah, I, I knew better than to do that. You know? Right. So. <laughs> yeah. I think Sarah has, you know, a really good point that, you know, you can, try your very best to like learn about your clay and its characteristics and how it likes to be moved and dried. And you know, when these things happen, like something blows up in the kiln, there's a crack, there's an unexplainable, you know, something going on with the surface. It just really keeps you on your toes all the time. <laughs> it does. And you kind of learn to, to roll with the punches a little bit better every time I don't know maybe now yeah no, for sure and it's like you yeah. learn like tricks like oh okay I got punched but I know how to fix it yeah. <laughs> right. that failure just leads to better problem solving right and you become better with like your creative solutions for how you're going to solve the problem so I feel like that failure naturally makes you right like better each time you solve the problem but even when you've been doing it for 15, 20 years, you can just, you can still be punished and you go, oh, I have to, I'm, I'm relearning something. Or if you change clay bodies, you change kilns, temperatures you're firing, any of those things can really just throw a wrench in everything, you know? Right. 
We have another question. Uh, this is from Cassie who asks, as someone uh, interested in working with clay or as someone who's interested in working with clay but felt that they had no talent or knowledge, where would be the best place to start? Um, so I, I think talent is an illusion. I don't think that's a real thing. I think uh, everyone has a natural ability to pinch material, right? Like drawing is mechanical and clay is the same. Um, so just starting anywhere, right? If you want to learn to hand build, start hand building, right? If you want to learn to use the wheel, take a wheel screwing class. But all of those things are mechanical and can 100% be learned. Um, yeah, and then for, uh... I guess just starting out with clay, um, a big points to note are um, the learning curve is very steep. So like, don't beat yourself <laughs> down because I've seen a lot of, you know, the whole age range of people really like being, getting discouraged as they're making something and it's not, you know, happening the way they want to. And it's like the first time using clay and I just have to remind them like, hey, let's, let's take a deep breath, you know, and just approach this um, situation. Because, you know, like I said before, every object you make is better than the last one because you learn so much about how to work the clay and pinch the clay. So it's like, you know, being in a relationship, you just gotta figure out what your partner's <laughs> attributes are so that you can, you know, bring out the best in each other. Fantastic. I'm just jumping in while, oh, here comes Mimi. She's coming back again. There you are. Mimi, you missed a great answer. I hope you <laughs> get to see it on the YouTube <laughs> video later. Um, I'll step back. Um, they were just talking about the challenges. And but, well, I did want to ask while well, I'm here. Okay. Um, yes, yes, yes. Hey. <laughs> talk about, like, we, uh, there's a puppy here. Talk about failure. You're talking about failure and, um, I was wondering if you find that ceramics with kids, and maybe you talked about this and I got distracted, but ceramics with children is a good way for them to get introduced to resilience, um, picking themselves back up, those kinds of um, challenges that you know kids need to learn. Yeah, absolutely. We focus so much like on this absolute success with grades and sports and ability, and um, you know they're they're not taught that you know, if you challenge yourself with any material, whether it's academic or physical like clay, right, that you're not going to get it the first time. It's okay to fail as long as you're absorbing something from that, right? And then you're taking it to apply it to something else. So with clay, you're building on that failure to be able to build the next thing, right? And in academics, I feel like it's stressed so much that you're not allowed to absorb that material, but maybe you didn't do great on the quiz or whatever. If you absorb the material and you learned from it, and then you learned from the quiz what you did wrong, then you learned more than the person next to you that memorized it, regurgitated it, and forgot it. And I think that's like the really beautiful thing about putting kids, no matter the age, in ceramics or any art medium, is when they're learning to draw a line for the first time correctly or pinch a pinch pot. Like they're not gonna do it great, but they're gonna build on that every time. Yeah, when I was uh, at the Morian Center for Clay at St. Pete last year for my residency, I was teaching a summer camp to the five and six year olds. And, you know, I guess their context of clay is just like Play-Doh. And, you know, they get the benefit of just you know, making something, they're not restricted as an adult. Well, like, well, how does this work? Well, I have to attach it like this perfectly. You know, they're yeah. more free to just really build. And then it's trying to help them like reel it in. Like, yes, we can build, but you know, there are structure, structural like foundations that need to happen if you want your project to survive. Yeah. But I really do see like, they just are unafraid of the material, you know? Because they're not scared to fail yet. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's the same with someone that's much older. Like when I was a resident at the Lux in Nebraska, I used to teach at retirement communities in the afternoons um, before I would go teach at after school programs. And these elderly people, they didn't care. They just wanted to sit down there and squish it, you know? <laughs> like they were like, I'm gonna smash this up. And like, they would have the best time 
same after school five and six year olds were building because it was just that expression of using their hands. And I feel like sometimes with high schoolers and definitely middle schoolers, they are afraid of that failure, right? It has to be perfect. Um, so it's really important to like give them that reassurance that failure is part of it to mm -hmm. let them experience it. But with little kids, they're like, oh yeah, there's no rules, watch this, you know? And they're gonna pinch it into- They're like, I already know awesome. what to do. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I got it. Just give me, give it here, I got it. You know, yeah. and I love that. No hesitation. Yeah, I think, you know, when people are first getting into clay too, that, you know, being very present and just realizing that, you know, there's a lot of information for you to take in mentally and physically with your hands working with the clay and to go into like a session and think like, I'm going to leave today with a box. I'm going to leave today with a cup. Like that just kind of puts the pressure on you. And then that's where you get all the negative emotions of failure and like, you know, anxiety. I'm just like, hey guys, it's an experience. Let's just, you know, go through it. <laughs> yeah. Someone wrote a really good comment. Um, I think it's L Pancakes, which is an amazing username. Smaller <laughs> is an illusion. Yes, big smiley face emoji. So I totally yeah. agree. Um, there's another question from Jody here, um, more of a Kind of technical question does Gainesville's humidity present any environmental challenges or perhaps the speed at which you can dry your work before firing um I look at it as a good thing like for the most part like we don't have to worry about stuff drying out <laughs> if we were being into Nebraska in the summer I'd like throw something an hour later I couldn't touch it you know uh down here especially my garage like I can make something, go back in the house, do laundry, have lunch, whatever, come back out. Like, we're still good to go. Um, I think we do take our kilns up a little slower, you know, to make sure that moisture's out of there. But uh, as far as from a working stance, unless you're in a rush, it's a pretty nice problem to have. <laughs> yeah, for me, um, it's great that, like, my things can stay wetter for longer, but it also, like, it's a flip of a coin where it's like oh I really need this to dry out so I can put it in the kiln <laughs> yeah. so it's just an extra step to like okay I have to place this in front of where the AC vent blows air out <laughs> or I need to set up a box fan in a corner so it dries this out but not the other things out <laughs> right yeah uh, I'm looking at the still image on your screen I think we lost her yeah, so um, when Elisa was showing the uh, instance holder that um, had the inscribed poem, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of was reminding me when I was looking at this, this box and I was wondering if either of you in any of your personal work either used um, do any sort of inscription or use um, like written word or anything like text in your in your work or use it in that way? Um, I personally do not, but like there's plenty of like other ceramic artists that really like, you know, hit it and hit it very well with like social commentary or like, you know, expressing feelings in their pots for other people to, you know, feel. But as far as my own work, I keep to like floral shapes and just, you know, more imagery than text. Yeah, I don't use any text at all in my work. Well, I have this box that we pictured at the beginning. And right now it does hold some incense materials. <laughs> Um, right now, you see that there is um, some quick light, quick light charcoal. So I would light something like this up to put in my sand. I wouldn't use the whole charcoal because it burns too long. I'd probably use like a fourth at a time. And then you can sprinkle some loose leaf uh, incense. This is white sage and cedar. And some other forms is the cones that smoke. 
And even just putting it in this box, like the box just smells of the incense. And like sometimes even just, um, cause I've had this box in my studio with the incense in it. And like, and when I'm in the main room and the AC turns on and I like get a little glimpse of the smell, I'm like, okay. And then I come and look at the box and open it. And it's just, it's like a, you know, surprise for the nose. <laughs> That's the same box from um, the video. Uh, it's no, similar. it's the box that you have on your PR and what mm -hmm. I had up at the beginning. But the box in the video is just, you know, made very similarly to this one. Uh, there's another question from Cassie who asks, do you ever listen to the clay? I mean, do you see the clay taking on a form that you did not intend and use that instead of what you planned? There, I see you smiling. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very intentional when I'm making, so I, I don't, I don't hear it very well. So <laughs> arg arguing back maybe that it doesn't want to do what I want it to do, but uh, no, no. Yeah, like I can imagine like on the wheel, like you already have this like predetermined shape that you want your piece to look yeah. like. But you know, my experience hand building when I'm pitching a form and like it does, you know, grow into its own, you know, shape. And I just look at it and I reconsider like, okay, maybe you would look better if you just, you know, had a little fatter tummy and like came up. <laughs> Like it does have like a personality of its own, even if you're wheel throwing, like it, the clay could be like, oh, you're using too much water. I don't like it. I'm not going to do anything you want. Yeah, I definitely had more of that experience than the other. <laughs> um, while you were talking about um, going back to some artist text or, or write to maybe um, make social commentary. I was thinking about what what do each of you in your personal work try to express through the clay, you know, is it an expression that you enjoy creating? Are you, you know, trying to communicate ideas about something in particular, anything like that? Um, Maybe none of the yeah. above. <laughs> no. <laughs> With uh, my work, uh, when I was in undergrad, a lot of uh, the work that I was making, you know, came from a place of hospitality. And at that particular time, it was through food and, you know, nourishment and how my plates and bowls and serving ware was kind of the idea of abundance and sharing and nurturing. And since then, it's just kind of moved into a direction where I want my work to elicit a feeling like how, you know, someone's happy if there's a vase of flowers, you know, in your home. Like, you know how happy you feel when you have flowers and you get that in your home and it just helps like put a bright spot in your environment. And that's what I kind of want my work to elicit for people who own it and use it. <laughs> I feel like previously my work was, um, a little more politically driven. My my MFA thesis work is about um, nostalgia and loss and about being a same-sex parent um, in the South before gay marriage was legal. Um, and then my pots previous um, to that and after are about same-sex couples and using fruit as a stand-in and relating that to, you know, historical paintings. Um, and even my clay, like when I started using earthenware, I was so tired of hearing about how porcelain had this greater step and how it was, you know, regarded so much highly or more highly. So I would use earthenware and dunk it in a white slip and go, look, it's just as equal. And I'm going to put these same sex things on it. And it matters to me. Um, I don't feel like that's necessarily as important to me now. Um, as far as for people to get that out of the pots, you know, initially switching from painting was like, if I was making a painting, you know, someone the, um, walks by the painting and might look at it for 10 or 20 seconds. Whereas if I put it on your dinner plate, you're sitting with it for 30 minutes, right? So that's kind of what caused me to transition to clay. But I don't feel like in my current body of work, that's the conversation 
I need to have. It's much more utilitarian. It's much more, um, you know, enjoying the food that's on it or the, co the coffee that's in the cup. Um, and right now that's kind of the direction I'm, I'm staying towards. Yeah, that's really interesting thinking about how long you sit with a painting versus, you know, the amount of times you would use, you know, a bowl, something like that. Well, even if you think about like the weight of a diner mug and the thickness of a lip and the horrible handle that is on it, right? And it's made to so that you drink the coffee quickly. It doesn't hold a huge volume. It's, it's um, you know, cast thickly so it can be slammed through a dish machine for years and years and not break right whereas if you're considering you know the amount of coffee you want to drink the way it comes out of the cup the weight of the handle and if it's close enough to to keep the object upright like all of those things um are a consideration in handmade pots that aren't in commercial wear right so those are those are things i'm more interested in but in investigating now than previously and then that changes the experience that you're going to have. hundred percent. If it's a cup you love, you're going to sit and hold it longer. If it feels good to hold, you're going to, you're going to drink your coffee more slowly and realize what's in your cup. Yeah. And it's all about that. Like, you know, you're, you don't realize how much you're, you are absorbing from your environment. And, you know, just as a flower, vase of flowers in the room kind of just helps the mood. Like, getting the chance to like, okay, I'm having steak and potato tonight. You know, what plate do I want to look at while I'm enjoying my meal? And, you know, same thing with, you know, beverages. Like when we have guests over, we're like, okay, here is our cupboard. Pick any of the cups that you want. And, you know, it's a special moment to, you know, curate your experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before we like hopped on the Zoom, I'm like, okay, I need water. What cup am I going to use? <laughs> I own this cup, but Bianca made it. <laughs> and it's like my one of the, my one, two, one go to cups. So this window, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I don't want to spill my water. <laughs> so this is a slab of clay here that covers this cutout. And when it hits the light, you can see through the window or you can see light coming through the window. So that's, you know, what she likes about porcelain is that that transparency that you can get and how she can like use that in her designs. It's really beautiful. Um, we have another question. So a, a couple more minutes. So this question is from Nigel. What are the advantages of the apprentice system over, say, learning in college? Do you feel higher education is moving away from teaching functional pottery over more conceptual sculptural ceramics? Um, I think everyone has to pick the path that's best for them. There's good things about all of it, right? Like if you want to go to school versus if you don't want to go to school. I think it depends on the type of work you want to make. I think it depends on the type of people you want to work with. Um, and I think for, for our studio, um, you know, people coming out of their undergrad, they, they have this really heady experience um, about like finishing work and what that's supposed to be. And they're surrounded by a massive graduate program. And for them to be able to take a step back and take a breath and go, but wait, what do I want this to be like, right? Do I want to be part of this institution? Do I want, you know, there's a whole new maker market that's completely separate from that that people are using social media for. Um, so I think giving people space for us is what is so important to figure out what's next for them. Um, and there are programs that are moving far away from pottery and there are programs that are moving right towards it. So picking the institution, if you want an institution that is best for you, I think is very, very important. Um, but for us, we try to give people the space to figure out what is next. Um, and do so without judgment, which sometimes can be very hard. Like I'm a colonizer. I want to tell you what to do and where to go and who to work with and how to work with them. Um, you know, and to, to give people the space to breathe and go, okay, what, what do I want to make? Right. So I think coming into our space, sometimes people take a minute it takes them a minute to get to making uh, because of that. Yeah. To piggyback off what Sarah said about um, being in school versus out of school, like the floodgates of the mind really do open because, you know, well, you're at the university, you have assignments, you have deadlines, and like, you know, you plan accordingly. But like when you graduate, you realize that, 
I got to, you know, draw up this discipline and make my own schedule and decide what I'm going to make. And there's a lot of decisions and like lifestyle changes that happen that you aren't, you know, aware of initially, especially in the learning sector where everything was so academic and, you know, there's a reason, there's a history and, you know, taking workshops outside of school, it's much more relaxed. It's like, hey, you know, just make whatever you want to make. I'm here to help. And, you know, my transition out of undergrad has been like a full journey of learning from different areas like workshops or like going to a residency and being part of a program. And then now this year, I'm trying to really gather what I've learned since I've graduated and kind of map out how I want my future to be. Yeah, that's why I think, you know, having something like Studio TM in the community is really important. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Provide that kind of space for people. I'm going to bring in Elisa really quickly for our last question, which is um, directed towards her. So she's coming in. Hi, Lisa. Hey. Hello. How are you? So we have a question for you. Um, are you ready for us? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Can I see Ilinda and Sarah in the galleries today? Oh, no. I didn't make yeah. it over. Oh, OK. I thought I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I wish I'd made it over. Yeah, I had, we were, we're already back at work. So. Yeah, Somebody I did, did like. I saw that the video that you did, like highlighting the scroll, like that is something yeah. I want to make a point to go <laughs> yeah. see. <in> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was like, I need to get over there and see the scroll for sure. Yeah, there were two people that were just totally engaged with the Kogo and I thought that's gotta be them. <laughs> <laughs> but I was far away, so. Distance, social distancing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> So the question is, in the video, Aisa showed a Tanuki figure made by Judith Nutton. Would love to hear more about her. Um, can you say a little louder? Sure. Uh, in the video, you showed a Tanuki figure made by a Buddhist nun. And this person would love to hear more about her, about the nun. About, the, about Rengetsu? Um, well, so Rengetsu was, um, active in the 19th century and she started off you know as um, um, a family woman and uh, tragically lost a couple of children and then lost her husband and then she renounced everything and became a buddhist nun and that's when she took on the the name of lotus moon and that was her her working name her pseudonym um, and then she became began writing waka poetry which is kind of like haiku a precursor to haiku a little bit different and then she inscribed them on her pot so not only do we have the tanuki um, in the harns collection but there's a whole uh, cabinet in the axline gallery in a exhibition called avenues of Ex exchange and there's several pieces by her in there as well yeah um, amazing women artists in our asian collection both from the past and the present, so um, it's wonderful kind of scope that we have between you know, our ceramic. So thank you, Elisa. We're kind of right on the end here. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, Ilinda, for taking the time tonight um, and sharing with us. About your work. Um, would it be correct to say that the lidded box instructions are accessible to folks that would be interested? Um, no, not the box, but we do have um, other projects on our website if you want to, you know, pick up clay and make it at home. So, you know, kind of keep the social distancing and, you know, being comfortable at your own home, making your own 
project and you know just feeling the experience <laughs> that we've been discussing the whole night <laughs> um for anyone watching uh you can find studio tm facebook page through the event for this um for museum nights and you guys are also on instagram yep yes and then instagram. we also have a website too yep. yeah definitely encourage everyone to, to check it out um and support Islanda and Sarah. Um, so thank you guys so much. It's been really awesome talking with you all. Yeah, thanks for having us. We had a great time. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Hey, bye. Have a good night. <laughs>